something um, to just trying something on new in your classroom um, and holding standards of academic excellence. Um, so anything, anything in between. But um, from what I took away from Dr. Love, it's just the idea of um, actively refusing injustice, not just in your teaching, but through as like a way of life. Thank you, Gina. I really loved how you're touching on the on multiple systems and ways that um, this work can take place. Um, Linda, would could we share? Could we hear from you, please? Yeah, is my audio working? It was being funny earlier. Great. Okay. Um, I think what I would add, I agree with what Gina says, but what I would add is that for me, it means centering joy and centering the students that are in the room. I think oftentimes, particularly as a teacher of color. Um, there's this idea that our job is to help Black students unlearn trauma, right? That our job is that in our classrooms, you're supposed to unlearn the things the world told them about themselves, the way that they are small, the way they are like not valuable. Um, I think where I shift and what I would add to that definition is that as important as it is to work against existing systems, we need to also actively work towards things that we are trying to see. Um, and when we spend all of our energy trying to undo something, we don't create enough room to imagine or to dream about what that other space might look like. So the other, the coin, right? The flip coin, the other part of it is that, yes, we are working against systems, but we are also working to center joy and honor where our kids come from and the things that they like bring to the table. So this idea that you are learning alongside students, I think feels like an important um, element of it as well. So yeah, so that. Thank you, Linda, for reminding us to center students in our work and also to center joy um, as well in the work that we do. Casey, do you wanna um, build on that? Yeah, um, thanks again for having me. Um, just building off of both Linda and Gina, um, I really would just also add, like it definitely requires an act of humanity and humility. Um, and you need to consider your own identity when it comes to abolitionist teaching and how, um, by acknowledging that, acknowledging that place, like you acknowledge inadvertent harm that you may cause in that space and learning to unlearn that, right? And actively like making this a part of your life, like what Tina said, um, which is another big thing that stood out for me from Dr. Bettina Love as well. I really appreciate how all three of you are bringing to intention um, how doing this work involves learning and also unlearning. Right, and in naming both those things, we're acknowledging the systems that are in place. Gina put it so nicely: systems that were built by white people, right, that haven't centered um, people of color, right. And those are things that we need to unlearn um, and also learn about, so we can um, work on dismantling that. So, thank you for sharing for sharing here. I wanted to um, just take a pause for a moment. Um, and ask our audience members to share in the chat maybe a word or two. What does abolitionist teaching mean to you? If you'd like to share a little reflection here. And then we'll move on to our next question. For me, hi everyone, I'm Carly. I am an alum of the original Wheelock College. I graduated in 2017. And I think that Linda hit it on the nail, um, the, hit the head on the nail with that one. Um, I think that it means folk not having a main focus on unlearning, but that imagination and creating like that place for dreaming, like, okay, so now we've done that, we've been here. so where are we going and how can we get, you know, get it to the next level and do what we can to show the excellence of the students that we're working with. Thank you, Carly, for sharing and also um, welcome back to 
to Wheelock um, in our virtual space. Um, no, thank you folks for sharing your thoughts here. And I would like to transition from that um, to our next question, or first to this quote. Um, this is by a teacher. He says, I think people aren't doing abolitionist teaching or anti-racist teaching because they don't feel the space for it. They're too busy checking off all of those minimum boxes. I think the public school system doesn't trust its teachers enough. If we give an easy curriculum to a bunch of teachers that we can't really trust, we at least know that something got done. Right? So there's a lot of work that happens in the teaching um, in doing abolitionist teaching work. And let's hear from our panelists. What challenges have you faced in bringing an abolitionist teaching perspective to your work? We'll start with Linda and then move to Gina. I thought about this question a lot. I think that there's, the challenges don't feel like they over, that they, there's more of them than there are like ways to find systems to make them work in our classroom. So for me, um, the challenges I think are kind of around that quote of just like there's things that I'm supposed to do. There's like parts of my job that like just don't align and really feel like they're putting kids in boxes in ways that I just don't necessarily agree with. But I don't think that abolitionist teaching is about doing one thing versus another. I think that it's more about the framing around those pieces and understanding where they come from, why they're there, right? So the part and the way that I guess I've addressed the challenge outside of that particular piece is that in my classroom and where I start and where I'm always working is the relationships with my students, right? So if we have a strong sense of our classroom and they have a strong sense of self in our space. When there are things that feel like we're checking out boxes, like studying for a test or prepping for MCAS or things like that, that almost so if we take away from their experience, they understand the bigger picture around why that's important, given the things that we were working towards. So the challenges are there if you are not intentional about the framing of your classroom. But if you are mindful and you include students in that process to dream and imagine and create that space with you, those challenges are not as prevalent. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, I was wondering, Linda, if you could talk a little bit about how you navigate the challenge of having, you know, to constantly co deal with competing priorities. You know how we have farmer school, like do the MCAS prep, do this, do that. And you're really like, but I want to center this. What are some things that you do um, to come against that when you get that pressure from administration or other colleagues? I think that the work exists within my classroom and outside of it. I think that I'm always in constant conversation. I work at a charter school, so I have a little more autonomy or flexibility than maybe at a, uh, at a public school that doesn't have that same space. But I think that part of it is that I'm always in conversation with my admin about like, hey, you're asking me to do this thing. Can we interrogate why it feels important to you? And like, it's always a conversation that I'm willing to have and engage in with them. I think that in my classroom, the thing that I focus on most and the thing I focus on first and my original priority is my relationships. So we spend the first like two months of, of school doing like narrative work mostly. I teach English so that again, like there's space in my curriculum to do things like this. Once I feel like we've established our relationship, I have space to be transparent about what I need to make sure happens in our classroom and why it's important. I don't think that, um, I don't think that MCAS is like not valuable, right? I just, I need to make sure they understand that it is not the end all be all, but their value with the students. And for me to be able to say things like that, for the kids to trust me when I say that this isn't the end all be all of who you are as a student, you have to have built that relationship prior, right? So the challenge is there, but students are as involved in addressing and like pushing against this piece as I am within my classroom and also outside of my classroom with the administration of my school. Awesome, thank you, Linda, for sharing. Um, and I really love how you're really centering your work and talking about the importance of centering your students and building those relationships with your students and establishing a space where um, you and your students can do this work together. Gina, can we hear from you? Hi, yeah, so, I think one challenge that um, I'm facing in my community is just thinking is thinking and talking to adults about what high expectations actually mean and look like. Um, I mean, we've had uh, conversations this year surrounding the fact that some people think that high expectations have to create a sink or swim mentality. And I kind of think that those are two separate things and they, that high expectations do not have to create um the sink or swim mentality 
and um, that there are kids that if you created that mentality, then they would thrive and they would um, flourish. But then what do you do with the kids who wouldn't? So with that aside, um, just thinking about high expectations and I teach high school. So obviously the expectations would look different in ninth grade as compared to a 12th grader. But um, I think this whole conversation came about because I had a um, 12th grade math student who at the end of the quarter was looking to turn in every single assignment um, that had been done before that quarter. Teachers, you all know what I'm talking about. And I said, no. That's not how we learn math. We don't learn math by doing it in one day right before the quarter ends. And he told me that this is how he's gotten by. This is how, this is what has, what, how he has gotten by and who am I to stop him in 12th grade. But if we think back and think about the expectations that we could have started in ninth grade, that kid would not have had that type of comment. So um, I also argue that teaching low expectations is what Dr. Love would say is teaching survival skills as opposed to teaching um, strategies for intellectual freedom. Um, so we um, also kind of have to wonder and go deeper on another level thinking about the implicit bias that comes into play for um, white teachers when we are holding students to lower ex students of color to lower expectations. So I guess conversations around that and um, really the conversations need to be student focused. Um, and I know that teaching is a very personal work and it's very personal to each of us, but um, I think communities really need to rally around the fact that we are about the student and if that means calling out an adult, then that means calling out the adult for the benefit of, of students. Um, so yeah, that's a challenge that I'm facing in my community right now. Thank you, Gina. Um, like Linda, you're you know really emphasizing the importance of you know what do our students need and giving them agency you know in their learn in um, in school, right? And centering their needs. And I'm wondering if you might be able to speak a bit to conversations you might have had with colleagues around um, high expectations versus low expectations. Sure. So this all is centered around the fact that we had some alumni come back and talk um, to students and teachers at our school, and they've all said that they've been very well prepared in terms of their sociopolitical awareness and um, not prepared in terms of the curriculum, and particularly in mathematics. And that's the subject that I, I teach. Um, we all know that math is a gatekeeper to allowing students to reach their dreams, especially students of color. Um, so the conversations that we've had are more rooted in, in um, the experiences and the anecdotes that students are telling us once they graduate. Um, we are yet to kind of implement what that looks like on a classroom by classroom basis, but it's in the works, it's there. Um, and I think the that, Hearing, hearing the stories is the important part in um, allowing us to be open to the, the criticism. I think that's a great takeaway for those of us here thinking about, right? Like asking our students, hearing from our students, hearing from our alum, right? What, um, what do we need to do to do? Um, what could we have been doing to do better? Um, what did, what was not there? What, you know, um, and learning from them. So thank you, Gina, for sharing that. So we've heard about challenges and we're gonna transition in a second um, to hearing from Casey and Linda about ways they've incorporated abolitionist teaching into their work. But I wanted us to um, just read this quote. Um, this is from an essay that Dr. Bettina Love wrote in Ed Week a couple years ago. And it says, so the question is not, do you love all children? The question is, will you fight for justice for black and brown children? And how will you fight? I argue that you must fight with the creativity, imagination, urgency, boldness, ingenuity, and rebellious spirit of abolitionists to advocate for an education system where all black and brown children are thriving. I call this abolitionist teaching. 
To all children, we must struggle together to create the schools we are taught to believe are impossible. Schools built on justice, love, joy, and anti-racism. And I think we heard notes of that from our panelists already so far when they've spoken about what abolitionist teaching means to them and challenges that they've faced. And now I'd like to ask, um, we'll start with Casey here. What are some ways you have incorporated abolitionist teaching in your work as an educator? Yeah, um, so I think this really goes back to the root of abolitionist teaching is a way of life, right? It's not just what you do in the classroom, but it's what you do outside the classroom as well and how, how you are as a person. Um, and so being able to speak to students, I am fortunate I work with 12th graders um, and I'm blown away by the conversations that they have and the space that we were able to create in our classroom. Um, and a big part of this is just allowing that space, right? And I think it's really, really easy to get stuck in your lesson plans and your timing and kind of, I mean, that's how we're taught to teach, right? Um, but giving space to let students ask the questions or pose them with questions. Um, a really great example I have is when we talk about data um, in science, from science teachers. When we talk about data, which is, comes up all the time, um, we look at not only what is shown, but also think about who made this, why did they show it in this way? Um, especially when it comes to things like human population. Um, and it stems those questions of, well, why, for example, is the entire continent of Africa broken down into one bar when all other countries have their own bar? Like why that's not like reflective of that whole continent. Um, and having students really kind of dissect that, giving the space to have them question um, and also find better data. Um, giving that ownership to students is a really big piece of that. And that's just like a very specific example, but as a whole, it's just, allowing that space, right? Allowing them to challenge, to criticize, something that's really hard to do. Um, I think especially, you know, this is my fourth year teaching. Um, and I think I've gotten much better in the last year. But my first two years, like, I don't, I don't think I would have been able to do that, right? Like I didn't learn to teach that way. Um, and so just kind of actively considering like, what am I presenting? How is it coming off? And how do we discuss this? Um, so that we can kind of face it head on is a really, really big part of how I teach in my classroom, especially virtually right now. It's just it's the best way to, I think, bring humanity into the room. Thank you, Casey, for sharing. I really appreciate, too, how you're describing that this is a process, right, and that it requires constant reflection and action based on things that you're seeing and experiencing and things that you're watching your students experience as well. Um, so thank you for, for um, bringing that part to attention to being an abolitionist teacher. It's not something we just do overnight, right? Um, it's a journey. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let's hear from Linda. I think that one of the things that our education system robs our students of many things, but one in particular is their autonomy and their ability to um, stand strong in a different opinion. Uh, I think that as students go through school, they kind of leave with like a really similar understanding of the world as so all their classmates without any room for uh, disagreement. And I think that that kind of feeds into other systems that we've talked about a little bit. So one, one way or one thing that I do, I start my classes all the same. Every single year that I've ever taught, every summer, every summer school, every chance I've gotten to work with kids, I do the same thing first. So we always start our time together with a timeline. So I ask students and myself um, to make a timeline of like 12 events between like when you were born until whatever age you are. And I ask students to think about like things that are important to you. It could be like when you lost your tooth, the time you moved, like it could be any variety of things. And we spend about a month of our time overlapping our timelines, depending on what we're spending our class doing. Uh, for example, if we're learning about the civil rights movement, right? Like we would focus on all of our timelines and then I would give them another timeline, right? Of like a, a child or someone of their age who lived in a different time period. It gives them a chance, it gives students a chance to build connections in a way that isn't just you like being talked at, right? It gives them a chance to kind of build a network between themselves and their classmates. We also have a timeline of where we are. So I teach in Boston, right? So whenever we do timelines about like neighborhoods and things like that, I give them one from like 12 years ago or 20 years ago, right? It gives them a chance to see the way that 
they are a part of the things that we're talking about. I think that a lot of times in schools, I think information is just given to students without any context and supposed to just like understand or memorize or repeat it back to folks without understanding the value of why they're learning about these pieces. So I think for me, I always start with being like, hey, you, you are here and the world around you exists with you in it. And I think that lesson, if that lesson doesn't stick, anything else we do won't work either. So yes, curriculum is important and the ways that we choose to use curriculum is important. As Casey mentioned, the things that we choose to present to students is important. And how we do those things is very valuable to students, but only if they have this pre-work done, right? Where they understand that like they are a part of this conversation and they are as, as valuable and as necessary to the next steps of it as I would be as a grown up in the room or as they would be in the future. Um, so the thing that I do is try really hard to make sure that we are reinstilling that autonomy and confidence in students so that they can ask those hard questions and like push where they need to push. You can't, you don't feel like you can push someone if you don't value your opinion, right? If you don't think that what you're saying is worth it, why would you ever push back against anyone around you? So I think the work of schools, unfortunately, has become the work of creating like empathetic, kind folks, right? And yes, also kids who pass tests and those other pieces, but our job really, at least from how I understand and interpret our job is to create more people who are willing to engage in these ways. Thank you, Linda, um, for sharing a very concrete example of how you do some of this work. Um, and I love that you st you're sharing something you do at the beginning of every class that you teach, right? You're really highlighting the importance of how this is something that we must do all the time with all of our students, right? And it starts at the beginning. Um, and I love the, the timeline idea and how you're really through that activity, really highlighting, you know, students' lives as just as important as the events happening around them and then creating a space for them to map those together. So I wanna thank you for sharing that. So we've talked about challenges. We've talked about ways that we are, you know, um, we learned from, um, from some of our panelists on ways that they're trying to do this work in their own teaching. And so I want to turn now to this quote by a professor who was reflecting on abolitionist teaching. And she says, if we're not cultivating black joy in our courses as professors, if we are not saying black lives matter and following up with readings, activities, reflections, and stories drawing from our students, especially those who identify as people of color and are multiply marginalized, we are missing a key aspect of what it means to be an abolitionist educator. And this professor is reflecting um, after uh, Dr. Bettina Love had given a talk to um, her university. And so all of the faculty and staff in the room, um, this is for us to listen, um, but we're going to hear from Gina and Casey what kinds of professional learning or teacher education training would you like to see to support your work in abolitionist teaching? Let's start with Gina. Um, I'll start off by saying that I love thinking about um, teacher education and thinking about teachers as um, continuing to learn. I have two student teachers at BU right now that are working with me and um, it is so much fun. Um, it is so much fun because it challenges me to think differently because um, I'm constantly learning through them. Um, so it's a little selfish, but I, I, I love learning through having a student teacher. But um, so I think this idea of like creating spaces for teachers to continue to learn, no matter if you're in your first year teaching or you're ready to retire and you're 30 years in. Um, there's one part in Dr. Love's book where she talks about theory versus practice. So understanding the theory is really important because it allows you to put a name to what's happening and what you see in front of you. Um, so there's culturally responsive teaching, culturally responsive pedagogy, uh, the culture of achievement from Teresa Perry. There's reality pedagogy from um, Chris Emden. Um, Abolition, abolitionist teaching from Dr. Love, um, uh, how to be an anti-racist um, from Dr. Kendi. I think there's all of these um, 
theories out there and it's really important for teachers no matter at what level they're at to be able to name what they see in front of them so what i envision for my ideal teacher edu education would be um, workshops to not only inform about the theory but actually think about what this relates to our practice um, and i really love the idea of small learning communities within a community having a group of teachers to be able to um, bounce ideas off of and on the other end having a safe place to reflect and being able to professionally um, call each other out and make sure that um, we're on the right track because that is what abolitionist teaching is all about it is a lifestyle and we don't always just like eating healthy we don't always eat healthy someone has to push us back on that track and having that community of teachers to support each other through that is um so valuable so 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 valuable gina do you feel like um you have that space um currently I think that in pockets, yes, but it's really hard to find. I work at a small school of about 40, um, I think about 40 uh, faculty members and it can be found, but I would really like a community where that's happening throughout and not just in um, a pocket of like the um, teaching and learning team and not just in a pocket of like these two teachers are next door to each other and that this is what's happening informally. I think that um, talking about like school culture, that culture has to be set um, for everyone to follow, that these are the expectations for teachers. And just like we have excellence for students, there has to be like expectations and excellence for teachers too. Thank you for, um, for sharing. Casey, can we hear a bit from you? What kinds of professional learning or teacher ed training would you like to see to support your work? Um, yeah, so I think I also agree with Dina that it was very interesting getting to think about this um, and thinking about my own ed education as a teacher um, and just kind of highlighting that uh, maybe there needs to be more of a refocus. Um, and sometimes I think with professional development and teacher training um, in the school, they tend to be geared towards checklists. Um, and abolitionist teaching cannot be a checklist. Um, and it cannot be an item that is just, okay, we talked about it this one meeting, right? It really has to be reflected in the mission statement. It has to be reflected in the hiring process. It has to be reflected in conversations consistently. Um, and having that space, having space designated every professional development, not just once a month, or maybe allowing those conversations and spaces to occur naturally um, with your peers. Uh, and also just, it's nice to just feel like your word is valued. Um, I've worked in two different schools and this comes from like per personal experience. Um, you know, the first school I worked at was standing up against things that just weren't okay and, and weren't really in the benefit of students um, was looked down upon. And I'm not gonna like sugarcoat that. There are definitely schools like that, right? The, the power struggle and pull. Um, and it's really important like when it comes to abolitionist teaching that um, we do have space to criticize um, and also and work together, right? I think this goes back to the whole like seeing teachers as professionals um, and yeah, professional learning, but also, you know, <laughs> let us have ideas, let us have thoughts, let us communicate, right? And so spacing for developing teachers need to include different stakeholders, right? It needs to not just be admin talking at you. It needs to be conversations with peers, it needs to be conversations with parents, it needs to be conversations with the community, conversations with students, right? And so I think for me, like that was the biggest thing is providing that space. Um, and that is something that I've seen done poorly and it's also something I've seen done really well. Um, and so I think I would like to really see less administrators hosting meetings um, and more of a constant reevaluation of what is working and what is not um, and what, where to go. Um, and that's kind of for my overarching feeling on that. <laughs> 
Thank you, Casey. I really appreciate how um, both Casey and Gina, you're both talking about how doing this work is, it's a process, right? Um, and you mentioned your teacher training, but then also professional learning experiences and spaces like while you're a teacher, right? And how you both named abolitionist teaching, it's not another box we put on our checklist, right? Um, Gina, you made a nice metaphor there, you know, um, like it being, you know, a lifestyle and a culture, you know, that a school is committed to, right? And that means reevaluating systems and thinking through systems. And Casey, you're giving some nice concrete examples of how like meetings and professional learning takes place and how, you know, systemically, maybe that's not the way to go, depending on, you know, the work that needs to be done and what's happening in those spaces. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I hope um, all of us faculty members on here were taking notes um, when Gina and Casey were sharing so we can bring that to our work. Um, but I wanna open it up now to the um, to folks that are here. Um, what questions might you have for Gina or Casey? And Linda had to leave, but she, I know she's willing to answer questions and she left her email um, in the chat. So if folks had specific questions for her, you can reach out to her that way um, as well. But I just wanted to open it up. Does anyone have questions they'd like to ask Gina or Casey, or maybe share a bit of how they see this work happening in their own experiences? Uh, yes, uh, Taja. Um, yes, hi. Um, also, just thank you to the panelists for um, everything that you brought to the table. Um, I think it's so important to talk about how we can put um, all of this education and aspects of cultural awareness to the table and how we can bring that to you know, ensure equity for students and education in general. Um, I'm kind of just wondering, Generally, um, you know, given that institutions are so concrete on certain policies and practices, um, how necessarily do you go about, you know, straying from this norm of what you're supposed to be teaching? I guess, I mean, I'm not in education, so I'm not sure how much flexibility you have in terms of adding to curriculum or creating your own curriculum or whether that's just something that you implement in your practice as a teacher. Um, but you know, how do you work to directly dismantle a system that is you know, certainly not built for every student? I'm struggling hard with that right now, if I'm being honest. Um, so right now my dilemma going on in my head, so I teach high school math and the dilemma going on in my head is thinking about how, um, if I could, right, what would I, what would I teach? Is it necessarily things that are on or labeled as standards in the common core? In some cases, no, in some cases, absolutely. But I think that um, the issue is that um, when to dismantle and where. So um, I, I see my classroom, right, as a small little thing in this huge uh, nation. But I, for example, if I um, decided to just not teach graphing lines in ninth grade, then what would that mean for them in terms of like their long-term success in mathematics? Would I then be um, eliminating the option of becoming a doctor? Would I be eliminating the option of them um, entering nursing school without that um, foundational math background? So I guess um, I can I can think about um, like pressing in other ways, like joining committees and DESE and thinking about where I can put pressure there, but I can't just stop doing the things that people say that need to be taught in mathematics just because I don't believe in them. Because um, then my students, again, I'm not creating opportunities for them, I'm actually limiting them. Um, but then from there, Tasha, I think about where, um, how I can take these things that are so traditional and so rote, like solving the equation, and then putting some um, like culturally relevant uh, pedagogy involved in that and the joy in the community that I bring in my classroom. So I guess I, I am struggling with that because I'm like, oh, this again? Like, 
uh, like right now, I'm, we are graphing rational functions in pre-calculus. We are finding asymptotes, holes. I'm sure everyone on this thing, on this call right now, does not remember what those things are. But again, will they be able to get into nursing school? Will they be able to get past an initial uh, math test that they test into calculus instead of college level algebra? So I am, I am struggling with that quite a bit in, in math. Gina, I want to thank you for naming and putting it out there that it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. And that it is a struggle and it's probably a daily struggle, right? Um, what are we going to do today? And where do I find the space for that and this, right? Navigating that, it is it is tough, you know, and, and challenging. And so I want to say, you know, thank you for naming that. And um, I think that's also, you know, can be a leaving for folks to hear too, like, okay, I'm having a hard time. And I learned a lot of great things from Gina. And she's also still having a hard time, right? And that's not okay. But that is, you know, um, that is the reality of where we where we are now. So thank you. Casey, did you want to answer that, um, address that as well? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would just like to add um, that whole, like, it doesn't happen overnight and just reiterate that it's, it's a commitment um, and it's also like being able to dismantle the things that we disagree with um, is very strategic. Um, and I know that might sound a little weird, but this reminds me of um, Rochelle Gutierrez. Um, she spoke, speaks a lot on uh, teaching mathematics for social justice. Um, and she had this line of you play the game so that you can change the game. Um, and sometimes it's navigating these systems even though we may disagree with them and understand that our education system is very much rooted in white supremacy and like that is just what it is um, but understanding that in order to dismantle that sometimes like you have to choose your battles um, and you need to make sure you have allies i think um, you can't do this alone and um, you shouldn't have to either um, this should be different schools are going to be in different places um, different schools will provide different spaces to have those conversations, to develop committees. Um, but really it just comes down to like, what can you put into it? Um, and if that means that you focus on your classroom first and what you can do and control in your classroom, then focus on your classroom first. Um, and then as you move forward, like things will be, will come up, you know, where opportunities will come up, chances to stand up, um, to have people who support you, to have people who will listen to you. Um, and and really kind of like rooting that into you know sometimes you do have to play the game so that you can change it thank you casey um for for responding to that question and for also reminding us that we can't do everything by ourselves right um look for colleagues look for co-conspirators right to do that to do that work you know with you gina mentioned i just wanted to say desi um, the Department of Education, you know, there are initiatives and, um, you know, different groups um, that DESE has, get on those list serves, right? And when they have open calls for folks to be, to write, you know, to participate in curriculum writing or giving feedback on assessments, right? Sign up for those, apply for those. Don't don't not do it because you think you're not experienced enough or because you think, oh, I'm an early teacher, I don't know yet. No, those are the voices that we need now, right? So when you see those opportunities, go, go there because that's the stuff that starts to filter down into right, the districts and then to our principals, right? And then to our classrooms, right? So when those opportunities um, present themselves, you know, try to jump on those. Um, Taylor McDonald, you had your hand raised, we'll come to you. Hi, my name's Taylor. Um, I've been really enjoying this talk. I just want to appreciate your guys' experiences and what you're sharing with us. Um, I guess for both of you, if applicable, what is the kind of administrative pushback that you've had or experienced? Um, and that has that broadened your perspective of how the educational system kind of silences or like minimizes student and teacher freedom and that type of thing and choosing your own curriculum and um, inspiring students to read more into POC literature and bringing POC authors into the forefront. I can tackle this one. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm tackling because um, 
in my experience, it's been, I've seen administrators who, um, for example, this year, I reached out to my principal and I commented on something of like an opportunity of something that happened um, and how we could have better addressed it like as teachers and just kind of reaching out being like, hey, I just want to make sure that like things don't go unsaid in the future and having a really like heart to heart conversation about race and like how, you know, me being a white teacher and him being a white principal at a predominantly black and brown school, um, how we need to think about how that's reflected. And it was really inspiring. Um, and my previous job, I would never have been able to have that conversation. Um, and there is definitely a power dynamic it is, as well as there's freedom. Um, there was freedom at that old school. There was definitely a uh, pushback on what kinds of freedom. Um, for example, when it comes to like curriculum changes, um, like, okay, let's, you know, let's get books that actually are, reflect our students, um, reflect our identities, reflect their experiences. Let's bring in that curriculum. Um, I think admin is usually more on board for that in my experience. Um, it's really when it comes down to, I think we should utilize time in this class to have this discussion and allow for freedom of that discussion. Um, that's where I've had like some personal pushback on. Um, and, and it was all about maintaining control and like the voice level of your classroom. And like, yeah, my students are really loud, but guess what? They're all talking about this. Um, and so I think it really, like, it depends um on what that would look like everybody's a little different um and really a big part of this career is, is finding a school that's going to let you do your best work um, and so i think that's that's my comment on that um taylor i've worked in two different uh boston public high schools one was a turnaround school with an outside operator and the school that i currently work in has far more attorneys than you could ever um, see or experience. So with the school with an outside turnaround operator, I had no say, no decisions. I had to crunch out spreadsheets that were given in various meetings and that did not feel great. Um, but now I currently have all of the autonomies in the world and I'm realizing that it's also not so great. Um, it is interesting because um, autonomies are wonderful, but there needs to be some, some um, uniformity among a department of teachers for vertical and horizontal alignment and just like logistics of um, the school. So I would say if you are looking for your first job, then you really have to find a balance of both. And I would say that that comes with a really strong leader who um, leads with um, a vision in terms of um, like that has heart that had, brings joy and like love to the to what they do, because then more people are going to jump on their train and and um, and follow that. But um, yeah, I would say one is not better than the other in, in my personal experience. Thank you, Gina. Um, and Casey and Gina, I appreciate you both naming how, you know, you're able to do the work you are now because of the place where you are, right? And so like leadership matters, right? And that cultural piece, which you brought up earlier, really does matter. Now it's 6.53 and um, our time is going to wrap up at about seven and I see two hands raised. So I'm going to call on um, Willie first and then Taja will come back to you. And maybe depending on the question, we'll have Gina or Casey answer Willie's question and then Gina or Casey answer Taja. So Willie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Willie Rodriguez, a professor in youth justice and advocacy. Uh, great panels and great conversation. I really have enjoyed it. I'm also chair of the EDI, so I'm very proud that you guys uh, accepted, that you, you all accepted this, um, this invitation and have shared some very valuable information. I think in part, Gina, Casey, and Linda answered some of my some of my some of part of my question was this um you're really introducing um you're, you're championing a sort of radical form of of teaching um which is in the you're and you're operating in institutions who have been in a traditional sense using uh traditional educational pedagogy it's very 
hard to even find a, 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 a curriculum by inclusion that uh, you know speaks through the voices of those uh, and individuals who are marginalized and communities who are uh, ethnic and racial communities. So I wanted, where do you get your most resistance from? Is it from your leadership in the institution? Is it from peers, other teachers who say, well, you know, that sounds all fine and dandy, but we have to keep to the core principles, the common core standards. Is it from um, the institution itself, the environment? So you're, you're really, where is the culture of resistance coming from most? Either of you want to take that? So, Gina? Sure, I can take it. I didn't know. <laughs> um, so again, I think I have a, a, a unique circumstance. The resistance that I'm experiencing experience is coming 100% from my coworkers. Um, so, I lead the math department, but I think I have one of the fewest years of experience. Um, I, um, this is my sixth year teaching and um, I've taught in two schools. My math department is predominantly made up of teachers who are in their double digit digits of teaching and mm. um, only have taught at that one school, student teaching and teaching in just at one school. Mm. So um, my, my resistant, my resistance um, mainly comes from uh, coworkers, but it, it's thinking about like thinking about what's best for students. I try to root everything that I present in data. Um, for example, mm. moving from a traditional geometry sandwich curriculum, which is so outdated, to um, an integrated curriculum where we're actually doing math every year, like all the different types of math um, that we use data. I use data to prove like, what do we notice? What do we wonder? What things could be better? So allowing mm -hmm. them to come up, it's kind of like with students, you just like let them come up with the answer and then you just roll with it. Um, but that's the, so I'm experiencing more resistance on that end. My um, mm -hmm. headmaster will come to me and ask my opinion, like, hey, Gina, I saw this in okay. um, another school for math. What do you think about this? Um, but I think that it, um, a large part of that is rooted in fear, like fear of change, fear of um, loss of knowledge, fear of having to learn something new. So when you understand where the uh, anger is coming from that it's rooted in fear it makes it much easier to just take the root of data and being objective thank you gina um for answering that that question and willie that was a great question thank you for bringing that i think that was like a question too to kind of start to wrap us up you know as we're thinking about the work that we do um how do we navigate resistance how do we navigate systems right and moving and moving things forward and so i want to close by thanking gina and casey and linda i'm going to leave but i want to name her as well for sharing your experiences with us so openly um i think this was a great conversation and a way for us to begin this work um, together so thank you for sharing your experiences with all of us that are here thank you to everyone that was able to join us and thank you to edi for creating this space um, with that, I'll turn it over to Stephanie. I think you had a, an announcement. That um, you... Just one more slide, if you could move that slide. Uh, yeah, just, just um, we, we meet every month at EDI and it's kind of one of the few opportunities where faculty, students and staff come together. Um, it is in the middle of the day, so I know that doesn't work for everyone. It's 11 to 1230. Um, so our next one's March 17th, but we're looking for other ways to bring people together like this evening um, event. So we're hoping to have more of those. Um, uh, Laura Jimenez is organizing something with Key Gross, who um, has a really great website. It's Woke Kindergarten. She's a black queer kindergarten teacher and really thinking about how she talks about um, who she is and who her children might be. Um, and, and she has a bunch of great videos and a really great website, so check it out. So thank you all so much. Chris, thank you very much for facilitating. You did a beautiful job. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Gina, Casey, Linda. Have a really good evening, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for joining.
Thank you. Thank you. Jeannie and Casey, I just want to say one more time, thank you. Um, it was really lovely to hear from both of you um, and for being so open um, in this in, the, in our conversation. So thanks. <laughs>